Do you so feel that impact from California yet? Well, they don't realize the cost. Mm -hmm. The cost of keeping that customer. Why so many people fail in this industry? There's some of us that are in this business because we're entrepreneurs, and there's some of us that are in this business because they really like roofing. If you're going to drive people to my website? Who's been to your website? Why would I want to work for your company? They're only working around the jobs they've already got. They're only working their referrals, and they knock around the referrals. Keith, last time we met uh, at the beginning of pandemic, you were very optimistic about business and life. How did it go? A year later, after yeah. pandemic, did it hit you? Did it surprise you how it turned out? Um, no. From a sales standpoint, we did really good. How did pandemic uh, hit the Texas and is it different from other states? Oh, it's very different. It, I think it was a much, we had an initial impact similar to everyone else, but then pretty quick, everybody was like, I'm not doing this. And so uh, basically everybody kind of just rebelled against it. They just said, we're gonna mitigate our own risk. We're gonna manage ourselves and told everybody else in society to manage yourself as well. If you don't, if you feel unsafe, you should just stay at home, but we're gonna go out and live our lives. And so Texas was probably one of the least impacted over, over, the, long run, over the long run, I would say. Business-wise, economy-wise? Yes. And you have pretty big influence from California. It's a funny mm -hmm. thing to say because Californians are coming to Texas. Right. And obviously California affected, I feel like, the most as far as like closing businesses. Oh, totally, yeah. Economy and stuff like that. Yeah, some of the do, East Coast was maybe worse, but yeah, California was Do you feel that impact from California yet? Uh, no, not where I'm at. I would say in the Austin area maybe, Houston area maybe. But Texas is a lot larger than most people uh, imagine even. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say the vast majority of Texas isn't really affected, but um, politically, I know in some of those cities, some of the climate is changing because there are so many Californians moving there, but that's why you see those bumper stickers all over the place that says, don't California my Texas. Uh, <laughs> what's your take on it? Um, oh man, that's a complicated one. I think that um, the 50 states were all meant to be different and unique, and the consolidation of power that happened with Abraham Lincoln after the Civil War kind of taking power from the states to the federal government has kept states from being as individual and different as they probably want to be. And I think that they should be able to be that. And that one state should be very different from another. If the constituents of that state want to live a certain way, I feel like they should be able to live the way they want, even if it's what I don't agree with. Um, so I think people moving to a place that is better than where they're from is should be a natural flow. If they want to move into a place that's more like them or more like what they want or a better economy, they should absolutely be able to move there. Um, I think in this individual instance, so much of it is economically related that they're bringing their politics with them, which is causing some friction. Um, but I think it's a natural part of the ebb and flow. And I don't know that enough Californians could move to Texas to influence Texas politics on a large scale. So I'm not super worried about it. Um, but yeah, I think it's pretty natural. Is Texas the best place to live? In the United States or the world? Uh, in the United States. Um, I think from an economic and business standpoint, I'd say there's not many that are better. I don't know that it's the best. That's pretty hard to measure. But I would say as a small business owner um, or from an economic standpoint, as an investor and stuff that's local, I would say Texas is way up there. Yeah. You said the world. Mm -hmm. where, where else would you go to live? Consider. Even. Um, New Zealand is where I would like to have a second home. Really? What's so cool about New Zealand? Oh, man. So uh, New Zealand is kind of a deeply spiritual place for me. It's mm. very beautiful. It's very majestic. Uh, the way that I feel when I'm there is... How many times have you been there? Uh, three times. Three times? Yeah. Make me want to go now. I want to go yeah. to Australia. I, I... I've been to Australia. I've done, I've done 50 countries at this point. Wow. Um, and I don't count like stopovers and layovers and stuff. Sure. I've actually... Visited. Spent time in and wandered around in 50 New Zealand countries. Stands out. New Zealand is definitely my favorite um, for the physical beauty, but more so just the power and the energy of the place. It's very healing. It's very restorative. The people there really love New Zealand as a part of the earth, not just as a country. So they really, really take care of it. 
Um, politically, it's very different, but it, there's a lot about it that makes sense. There's actually a lot of things that you can think, sure. not just right or left or Republican or Democrat. There's a whole lot more out there than that, but we don't ever discuss it in our country because those two parties, we think they're at odds with each other. We think there's a, a, a power struggle, but in all reality, it's just a balance of power. They're keeping everyone divided. 50-50 so that the, both sides know they have a job and that they get to do what they want to do and they trade seats every once in a while. But they've drawn all those lines on purpose to keep everybody right where they're at. They don't want anybody moving uh, from one party to another. So they don't want to introduce any new ideas. They just want it to be the same. And uh, I'm not interested in that. There's powerful things about the way that socialist governments operate. There's benefits in some places and sometimes for certain people groups, um, you know, there's just a lot of different get, ways you, to think. You, you're getting political. Do I mean, see? I don't think I'm getting political. I think I'm getting <laughs> philosophical. Sure. No, no, no. In a good yeah. way. Yeah. In yeah. a good way. Do, do you see us? Where do you see yourself after roofing? Um, my long-term goal is really, and I'm, I'm pretty close, is just to be able to invent the things that I want to invent and make what I want to make and not have to ask anybody about it or borrow money from anybody or have anybody else think it's a good idea. I just want to be able just to make it, it if I like it. Yeah. Okay. And then if it's not a good idea, then I'll live with it. It's fine. So interesting point about New Zealand, the Maori people there were the only people that didn't ever lose to British colonial powers. They're the only people on the planet that the British couldn't defeat. They sent their Navy multiple times, thousands and thousands and thousands of troops with guns and cannons and horses and all the most uh, technologically advanced you know, methods of warfare at the time. And the Maoris beat them every time with sticks and stones. Wow. Defeated them over and over and over again. They're the only people that ever, that Britain ever created a treaty with and acknowledged, we can't beat you, but we would like to live here. Can we have a treaty and share this land? They're the only people they ever did that with. Uh -huh. And because of that, the, the ramifications of that long term is that the Maori people are greatly re respected. The Native Americans in America are like the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. They're the usually the poorest, least educated, least respected, least but the government integrated. Pays them here. Say what? The government pays them here. It's I think in certain instances, yeah. I don't know all the details, but um, they're not looked at as a valuable asset or an important part of our history. Sure. Uh, there, they're very respected. And so um, the way that the Maori people feel about the land and the earth and the spirituality there has spread into the national peoples, all the people that have emigrated there end up becoming part Maori. They learn the language, they respect the beliefs, they participate in their ceremonies and care for the land the same way. It's really, really beautiful and powerful. But it's because... It sounds like an Avatar movie. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe, I suppose. I, don't really, I, 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 think I remember Avatar, a little bit about that movie, but not a lot. You have not watched Avatar? Yeah, but I don't remember that part of it. I remember. Yeah, well, you know, like humans come to this beautiful planet. I think they're actually filming in New Zealand. Oh, new, yeah. new episodes. I think it Maybe. definitely was inspired by the story. Sure, sure. You're doing 75 Heart. Have you completed it yet? Or I did not. I uh, still doing it? Uh, I'm going to start again here in the next week or two. You I had to quit get off. 75 Heart? My doctor pulled me off. What happened? Uh, I don't want to get into it, but he had to do a little <laughs> procedure. I had stitches, just couldn't work. Got it. Couldn't work out, so I had to go on rest. And since then, Why I Why did you decide to do it in the first place? Oh, I just want to make a change in my body. Try CrossFit. Say what? Try CrossFit. Have I tried CrossFit? Try CrossFit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, There's no I, trying. You just go in and, <laughs> yeah. and you don't quit. I, I did CrossFit for a while uh, back in the day, but my body is pretty damaged from the years and stunts that I did. When I was a stuntman, I've got a lot of little nagging injuries, and CrossFit's pretty challenging in that department. I see. If, <laughs> I got, if I got light, you know, if I got down to the weight that I'm supposed to be at, it would be a lot easier. Um, but because I'm already carrying too much weight, you know, all the dynamic movements and stuff are just bad for my joints until I get light. So I'm focusing on uh, mountain biking, yoga, um, that's some strength. That's good some strength training. Yeah. I know you do yoga. I mm -hmm. know you do meditation. Yeah, yeah. Teach me meditation. How did it change your life? And what, what's what's the game? I mean, we're so busy. Yes. I, I cannot freaking med. I mean, I can read. I can. I sure, do sure. read my Bible. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But how do you meditate? Well, first I had to understand why I needed to meditate. Okay. And for me, it was a journey of learning that my body was a part of me. I used to think that like my mind was in control of everything, and that my mind should be in control of everything, and that my emotions and my body are faulted and fallible and you shouldn't trust your emotions. 
and you should really kind of put that stuff to the side and just use your mind to drive yourself forward. Um, I had a lot of trauma as a child, suffered a lot of intense abuse, and as a result of that PTSD, I just kind of like separated from my body because, you know, that kind of physical abuse is in your body and your brain will just kind of separate from it so you don't have to experience that stuff that same way. Uh, it's very common for people in trauma, and in doing that, I just really just disconnected from my body. I didn't value it. I didn't pay attention to it. I didn't pay attention to aches and pains. I didn't pay attention to what I ate. I just, my, value, my body was not a part of my consideration of what I was doing day to day. And, um, <clears throat> but that cycle of trauma and how you feel depressed, stressed, anxious, worried, that stuff is all in your body. You think that it's created by your mind, but it's really, you feel all of those things in your body. It stores there, it kind of activates there when you, sometimes your brain is totally at rest and your body will start to create stress because it's just how it's used to operating. So I had to actually pay attention to my body. And for me to learn to get in touch with my body because I ignored it for so long, um, I had to find ways to slow down and listen to it. But first I had to understand why I was doing it. Why was I meditating? It's because I needed to understand my body. I needed to pay attention. Um, I also needed to get out of the moments that were in my head, which were usually future or past. They weren't right now. They weren't about this moment and what I'm sharing with someone or the decisions I'm making. It was about what's going to be the outcome in a year, good or bad, stressful or blissful, thinking about some outcome that makes me feel good or thinking about some outcome that makes me feel bad. I wasn't often in this moment. And this is the moment you have to operate in. So if you're always in the future and you're all, or you're always in the past, you're missing most of what should be happening right now. And for me, the only way to get into this moment was to get out of my mind and put those thoughts to the side and feel and experience the present moment. And that's really what meditation is about. Feeling and experiencing this moment and being able to accept it for what it is, good or bad, then you can actually make really present decisions about what's happening right now. But normally, our American mindset, our business mindset, is just about making decisions for the future. And you normally drive through this moment without experiencing it, without remembering it. You run over people. Uh, you say things that are hurtful or you miss opportunities. There's things you're not paying attention to when people are opening doors for you to build relationship with them, et cetera. You just miss it, whether it's your wife or your kids or somebody at your business. And so I had to realize that that's not how I wanted to live. And in order to live the way I wanted to, I had to get in touch with this moment and my body is what grounds me to this moment. And so knowing that there was a purpose, a powerful purpose behind meditation, then I was willing to try it. And I, I looked at meditation probably the way that you look at CrossFit. Like we are probably different complements of a, of a, you know, on the other side of the scale. I wanted to train my body and my mind and my heart how to be the person that I wanted to be. And so I've probably gone into that as aggressively as you've gone into CrossFit. So how long do you meditate? And what's the process? Um, it sort of depends on the day. Um, it depends on what I'm experiencing, but I would say on the average day, probably 30 minutes, maybe an hour. So describe the process. What exactly you do? Um, so for me, the most powerful meditation that I do is um, uh, I sit somewhere comfortable, you know, where I can stay seated for a long time. I kind of sit in the traditional meditation position. Um, and Which is it, like it all starts... Lotus, they call it? Like yeah, for me, I, don't, I can't get into that position very well because of my legs, but basically just crisscross applesauce on the floor. Usually I'll sit on a little pillow or something so I can okay. stay there more comfortably. And um, it Morning starts, or evening? Uh, it depends on the day, but usually morning. Okay. Um, and I start with breathing because really our breath is really our whole life. Sure. It's what operates everything in our body. Sure. And so I usually just start with my breath and focus on my breathing, bring my body down, calm down, let my mind go to sleep by actually focusing on my breath, what it feels like, what it sounds like, what my body is doing in the moment. And usually from there, there'll be some version of visualization, thinking about the way that I've been feeling, recognizing it recognizing my emotions leading up to that moment or that morning or the night before or yesterday at work, feeling what those things are, trying to understand why I was feeling that, the motives of the people around me, just kind of processing that information because normally you're holding on to that. And so it's hard to move from this moment to the next because you're carrying something that's not resolved from previous moments. So I'll resolve those things and let them go. Somebody said something to me at work or whatever that I didn't like, that's like hurt my feelings or made me angry or whatever. I'll recognize that thing. I usually. I usually feel it in my body. Like I feel a fence in my shoulder. Somebody's offended me. I feel like I'm carrying something or somebody hurt my feelings. I feel it in my heart or whatever. And so I recognize those feelings and I process them and I let them go so that I can get back into this moment without worrying about yesterday. 
And once I do that, then I start to think about today and what I want to do. Do you check your phone be. before you meditate? I try not to, no. I uh, rarely check my phone. So guys, I, I want to take a quick break here. So I want you to understand, like this is Roofing Insights, channel for roofers. This guy runs what, $30 million company. We talk about meditation, that led that thing. I mean, I would say probably 95, 98, percent of people completely checked out already like what the heck but here's the thing i've seen so many people making horrible mistakes i'm talking about um, stuff that leads to business failure osha violations when you move too fast when you like and i'm guilty of that oh, when, so when, am I. when you don't stop to think well yeah, yeah. people tell me all the time i don't have to, i don't have time to exercise i don't have time to do this I, and I, I see them on the facebook all the time like, go watch like good test for you if you have time in your life for meditation check out your screen time how much time you spent on facebook on use on your apps and i guarantee you i guarantee you 90 percent of you will find at least 30 minutes for this continue please sorry um <laughs> So I want to be able to let go of everything that I've been carrying, feeling, so that I can be in this moment and decide what I want the next few moments or the next few hours or the next the rest of the day to be like and find intention for what I want to do with that time. And in this moment, you are not like writing that I have, I don't, I don't meditate, mm -hmm. but what I do is like I sit in the sauna. I did offer you a meditation challenge where I would meditate sure. with you. And I'll accept it, but okay. uh, you heard we, it. <laughs> I'm excited. What, what I do, here's my meditation. I do a lot of sauna, so I work out and then yeah. I go to sauna and actually I do a lot of writing. So sure. I, I do like 45 minutes in sauna, I do cold plunge and I do sauna right. and I'm just writing my thoughts, whatever. It's it's not meditation. I mean, right. sauna it's, it is, is kind of, is kind, kind of, of yeah, yeah. but it's, I'm getting my thoughts together for the day. I usually write content or I'm thinking about what, where do I need it the most? Because I juggle a lot, a lot of things too. And it's like me in a wooden box under the heat <laughs> trying to... Do you have your phone in there? Uh, sometimes I do, most times I don't. Sometimes I'll try to leave it out. So, but uh, what's the challenge? Like, how do you do it? Like. Uh, I mean, we really just have to sit down and do it. It's kind of difficult to explain, but a lot of what I found with people that I've meditated with that have like just let go and had the experience and not worried about whether they thought it was going to work or not going to work or whether they were going to be able to do it or not. Um, especially a lot of really fit people. I think what you start to discover is a lot of what you actually like about working out is actually the state that you put your body in where you have to breathe as much as you do. In our normal life, we don't really breathe very fully. We don't experience it, we don't feel it, we don't pay attention to and, it. Uh, I follow, what's his name, uh, Hoff? Wim Hof. Wim Hof. Yeah, I've done some like breathing. That's scary stuff. You can take a couple deep breath and you're about to faint. Like, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Like, I've never yeah. thought about it. I just did that like two months ago and I did the whole mm -hmm. breath work for like 40 minutes and then you get in the ice. I did I that I tell like people all the time, it's all in your head. It, even here, we're doing this challenge, right? So you lift the shingle and you hold it. And, I, and you can see in people's faces if person have it or not. Like yesterday, I didn't, at minute 30, I thought that's it, I'm dropping. And I was like, no, I'm not dropping. I close my eyes and I, and I stick there for another minute. So it's crazy with, with your mind and body capable of if you really put it to it. Totally. And you can get into a place with meditation that you feel. But breathing too. A lot of athletes, they don't, uh, in the Navy, they say slow is fast, fast is slow. What it really means, like if you have to do 100 reps, like imagine barbell or back in the day we were doing fittest roofer with a bundle of shingles. So you can lift 100 um, times bundle of shingle above it. So you can do it unbroken and I can lift it and break it every time and take a deep breath in between. Right. I'm going way slower, but I'm going to beat you. Yeah. Because you, after 20 reps, you're going to be exhausted, out of breath, and then going to keep going. Yeah, because it's uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Yes, yeah. absolutely. How do you start a meditation? Is it, uh, do you, besides breathing and thinking, what else, what other so components? So there's uh, usually a visualization element where you're imagining something. And for a lot of people or a lot of... Like you can use apps like Headspace. A lot of people use that app effectively to start their meditation journey. Like with the music and stuff? Uh, it's background. normally a guided meditation. It'll tell you what to think or do. It might have a little prompt on the screen of what you should do next. Um, but a lot of it's visualization, like imagining like a ball of light outside of yourself and uh, moving that light around inside out to your, outside of your body or taking a deep breath and imagining that ball of light expanding and getting brighter 
and breathing out and getting dimmer. And there's nothing powerful about this thing that you're imagining. It's really just giving your mind something to focus on so that your body can have its experience without fighting with your mind. It's not really about what you're imagining. That's sort of just kind of like a placeholder. You know, there's nothing powerful about the light that you're imagining. Sure. Um, but if you do it without questioning it and without thinking, why would I imagine that? Well, just do it because a lot of people do it and they're telling you to just experience it, just try it. And you'll feel the benefits of letting your mind relax and release all that stuff that you've been carrying. There's such a mental load that we carry. Like you've got your phone sitting on your knee, you had notes on it, but there's a weight that comes with that phone being there of all the people in the world that can get a hold of you through that phone, all the things that you're supposed to do later today. You carry all of this mental and physical load of those things and doing meditations and exercises like these allow you to just set all that stuff to the side and have a few, mo a few moments of clarity and kind of reset your body chemistry, let go of all the stress hormones, bring in all the positive endorphins that you really need um, and just kind of bring yourself back to a moment of balance or what some people would say being centered. You know, being right where you're supposed to be, thinking what you're supposed to think is the really the most powerful place that you want to be. You don't really want to step outside of your strengths. You want to step outside of your intentions, the things that you value. You want to stay right in that spot where you're doing the things that are most effective for you to be doing. And when you don't take those moments to let go of all those little things, those things become urgent and they pull you out of what you really want. So you end up having a conversation with someone that's stressful or challenging, or argumentative or whatever it is because you carried this load of offense for them or frustration for them and it just pulls you out of the place you want to be where you're effectively accomplishing your goals and living your authentic self where you're happy with who you are and everybody's happy with you. Um, so if you don't take those moments to let all that stuff go, however you do it, then you're constantly getting pulled out of that and you're answering to the urgent. Whatever is urgent in the moment, whatever is the most necessary to do because this thing's about to break or this person's about to quit or my bill's late on this thing or this bill's going awry, um, you'll end up living always in those moments and you won't actually be making the big steps forward. You're actually just running on a treadmill, getting really tired, but your life isn't really moving forward. Absolutely. Business owners get trapped in that really quick because there's so many things that you could be doing. You've got to find a way to prioritize the top like three things every day you should be doing. You shouldn't be doing anything else but those. No matter how urgent they are, you need to let somebody else handle them. And sometimes yeah, if there's a fire, sometimes it's better to let it burn down, whatever that thing is, and fix the thing that's in front of you that's important. Because if you fix that thing and don't do this over the long run, you're, this is going to be a much bigger problem than that. But if you don't take time to center yourself, you're going to focus on the most urgent thing and you're always going to be stressed out. Did you move to the new office? Not yet. What happened? Still in process. We got tangled up with the city and permits and... Oh, wow. Then COVID and materials affecting things, subcontractors. It's just been a very challenging process, but we are close. What kind of turnover do you have in your business? Um, well, if you're talking about office people and laborers, like office sales people, like people uh, sales who people, actually employ. Right. Uh, last year was our worst year for turnover in sales. Um, a lot of that had to do with COVID and storms and uh, jobs getting delayed. Like a lot of our jobs wouldn't having a very difficult time getting paid because the insurance adjusters weren't able to work because they were all shoved to the side after COVID and then there was a couple of big storms in our area so that they had to focus on that and the job closings just took forever and ever and ever and we lost people because they were having a hard time getting paid or getting a flow of cash through the jobs to themselves even though the cash still came to them it just got really delayed um, and then COVID did make things, some things hard and then we had a big storm that got pretty stressful after we signed up too much work You know, we signed up more work than we could really effectively do. Hmm. And so it created a hard atmosphere for those project managers to get those jobs done. They had a lot of unhappy customers. And so a lot of them didn't stick around. And that was a really painful lesson for us. So uh, salespeople more than anything, which I think is to be expected. Um, but we have usually much less turnover than market average by far. Uh, inside the office, um, our turnover is usually us letting people go um, because it's not the right job for them. We don't have a ton of people that quit their job. Do you have non-compete agreements with your sales guys? No. You don't? Why not? Uh, they're not enforceable. They're independent sales contractors. Many do. Many do. Insurance. I know, but they're, they're, and this is just me not speaking to anyone specific, sure, sure. that's morally wrong and legally not enforceable. An independent contractor can work for whoever they want, whenever they want. That's why they're called an independent contractor. They could sell roofs for you and sell roofs for that guy, or they could sell roofs for you and flooring for that guy, or they could run their, you know, MLM on the weekends and sell their Absolutely. whatever it is, and then sell roofs Tuesday, Friday, and Monday, or whatever, you know? Um, they're independent, that's the whole point. They can do whatever they want with their time. 
and you don't get to dictate it at all. Uh, do you have a cancellation fee in your uh, agreement? No. You don't have cancellation? No, there are some situations in a commercial setting where we would because we have long amounts of time invested into a project and um, we could lose the project to another customer or to someone just deciding to keep the money or something when there's lots and lots of money already invested. So in a commercial setting, yes, but in residential, no. How I don't do you, want to fight with somebody that doesn't want to do work with me. If somebody says, hey, I want to go with somebody else, I say, hey, thanks. Hope you have a good experience. And I move on down the road because the energy it costs me to try to get that person back into the system. And what's the point? Let's yeah. say you have 25, 3,500. So many people are wrap their mind around it. Yeah. They just well, they don't realize the cost. Mm -hmm. The cost of keeping that customer. The energy it takes to convince them to stay with you. Whatever they already you don't say. want to do business with you. Right. It's probably going to cost you a better review anyway. To me, it's the same as trying to convince a girl to date you. Dude. If she doesn't want you, just move on down the road, bro. Don't talk her back into it. That's really good. You know? Just yeah. move on down the road because it's not going to be a great relationship after that point. That's the customer that's standing in the yard with binoculars looking at the counter flashing like inch by inch as they're taking it off and putting it back. The person you talked back into it. They're the ones how that... Do, how do you deal with a customer like that? Who puts the chair and washes the crew. <laughs> that's all I mean, the that's, that's a case by case thing, you know? Um, I think most of that is solved in the presentation, explaining the process that's going to come before the build day, telling them what to expect, explaining everything that you're going to do. If someone is outside the house, what I did when I was doing that job is I pulled them over and I engaged them. Instead of resisting them, I would say, look at what we're doing here. We're doing this right here. We're doing that right here. This is why we do that. I just start talking about what we're doing. I just narrate the scene for them. And then they start to go, okay, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. You know? Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of puts them at ease. Because normally they're uh, discomforted for whatever reason because they think something's going to go wrong. Somebody's not paying attention or somebody's trying to cut a corner or whatever. And so I just engage with them and tell them everything that we're doing. Every little detail and they kind of get, you know, eventually just get bored. Uh, and they realize, okay, somebody's on top of this. And then they go back inside. But when the person comes out and sits in their lawn chair and you immediately have resistance towards them and you start to uh, have resentment towards them for looking over your shoulder, you know the crew is uncomfortable, that kind of energy that starts moving around, that person feels like they should be there then. Because they're looking at their own project in their own house, they're spending their own money on it, they should be able to look at whatever they want. Absolutely. So when you start resisting that, then they start getting uncomfortable and the more they want to be in that spot trying to figure out why you're trying to hide something. So don't do that. Just engage with them. Let them have all the information they want. Take them, take them up on the roof if they want to go up there. Let them use the nail gun. I mean, I've engaged with people all different kinds of ways to just put their uh, put them at ease. And then once they find that spot of ease, then they just go back inside. They leave you alone. Love it. Also, don't do work for ex uh, for engineers. Oh, lawyers. Lawyers and engineers. That's our two uh, caveats. We don't ever really, really want to work for them. And I know that's kind of a joke, but. Uh, that's where you're going to get all your troubles, especially with the engineers. If they're any kind of engineer, they're absolutely going to know everything about roofing that you don't know, and they're going to know how to do it way better. And uh, Why don't they do it themselves? Yeah, I've, I've literally asked them that question before. <laughs> Why would I want to work for your company? Why would you want to work for Avco Roofing? Um, <clears throat> well, as a sales guy, I would say there's uh, an opportunity for you to find a path in life that is willing to compensate you for the amount of time and effort that you want to put into it. Everybody and else sells this. Say that again? Everybody says that. Every roofing business offers that unlimited earning potential. No, 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 that's not what I said. <laughs> I said you're, you're able to earn what you're willing you to put in. You said it in a sexy way, in a mm -hmm. nice way, but no, it's, not not truly, it's, not, it's not unlimited potential, <laughs> but what I was getting to is it rewards you for your skill. Yeah. You work at this salary job and you're two times better at your job than that guy, you make 3% more. Sure. At this job, if you if you're twice as good, you make twice That's as much money. Plan. You know, and if you want to make more money and you want to put in more hours, you can do what you want. If you need to make up a certain budget deficit over time, you put one more day on your schedule of work that you control, and you can do that. Few more appointments. Yeah. Other jobs, you can't do that. You can outwork everybody else around you and maybe get a promotion and get fifteen percent more. At this job, if you outdo everybody around you, you're making mad money. You know, and you are in control of it. You can you can turn customers down that you don't like. You can turn down the small jobs that you don't want to do and only look for the big jobs. You can only do the tile jobs because you really like tile. Sure. You're kind of managing your own destiny at that point, and you're betting on yourself, which is where people usually do the best. It's when they're betting on themselves. Mm -hmm. And so there is a lot of potential in that. There's not just economic potential, uh, pay potential. There's growth potential. What's your backlog right now? Like if I sell a job today, when after will produce it? Oh, less than two weeks. Two weeks? Really? Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Like. Excellent production, 
Yeah. I mean, if we had a big storm, I think it might stretch out to like six weeks. But really, hardly ever is it ever any longer than that. Awesome. And I would say at our peak of the year, it might get to three or four weeks maybe uh, for a few weeks here and there. Sales guys must love it. Yeah. There's nothing worse than selling and... Well, the, the truth about sales guys is if they've never worked somewhere else where it's different, they don't know that it's better or worse. Yeah. If they worked at somewhere where the backlog was two or three months all the time, they would think we were the bee's knees. But the guy who got his first two jobs done in a week, when the third job comes up and he has to wait three weeks for it, he has a freak out and thinks he's never going to get paid and this isn't the job that he signed up for and mad at everybody and, you know. So it all it's all a matter of perspective, I guess. Sure. Last time when I left, you were just integrating Job Nimbus. Mm -hmm. The finish done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're fully integrated. Um, we've had a great experience overall. There's, it was well, a lot a, of there's a caveat in that sure. is that I believe that all CRMs are going to have challenges. They're never sure. all going to do what you want them to do. They're all going to have pain points. They're all going to have limitations. So for us, we had to pick the one that we felt like was most like what we wanted, find the workarounds for the things that it didn't do. But most of all, I had to find the one that my guys like working in. Because okay. if they don't like being in the CRM, I don't care what it does, you're going to have a hard time getting compliance from them because they just hate the experience of being in that CRM. Exactly. And so I went with the one that the guys liked the feeling of the most, knowing that no matter which one I picked, there was going to be shortcomings and limitations. And it changes too. Like they, they actually improved this year more than anything. Like you know, yeah. with the funds they have, like I see more and more features. Because oh, I totally. travel a lot. I see it. Now yeah. you can you arrive at the job and Jeff Nimbus will tell you, hey, sure, you're sure. this job, do this. Yeah. Yeah, I think as far as roofing specific CRMs, they've got to be the most innovative. Um, they're trying the hardest to grow and change. Um, they had some transaction, I think, that happened recently where they ended up with a lot of cash infusion and they've hired a ton of people. They're building a ton of new features. Um, it's an exciting place to be, but no CRM is perfect. So if you're looking to be happy with a CRM, you're on the wrong road. You're not going to be happy you have with to build it. You, 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 yeah. you have to do it. You have to make your people accountable. What KPIs you track daily? What's the most important KPIs to you personally as a business owner? Um, I would say I look at numbers weekly. I don't necessarily look daily. Um, we are uh, implementing the EOS system in our business. And so our level 10 meetings we have on Mondays with the executive team, there are numbers in that meeting. Um, I will hear the numbers there. We will talk about the numbers and the issues related to them, but I don't check them daily. But each of the people that are responsible for those things, definitely check them daily. Um, Can you name a few KPIs that's important to you? Um, me personally, I really like to know how many doors are knocked. Mm -hmm. um, because I can do the math and extrapolate all the rest of the numbers from there because that's where it all starts. Um, but by the day and by the week, if you were going to measure them from a sales perspective, it would probably be signed contracts and built jobs. Those are the two most important ones. Um, after that, you would want to know how long it's taking to collect the money. So an average collection or close rate after the job, after the last day of uh, work is done, how long is it taking you to collect all the funds and finally close the job from a financial perspective? Um, and depending on our season, what we're going through, that's anywhere from 30 days to 90 days. And obviously 90 days average across hundreds and hundreds of jobs is really bad because it means there's some out there. That means there's probably 20 that are at a year. And there's a bunch that are at nine months. There's a lot at six months. And then there's a bunch that are running at our, at our average without any problems at 30 days. But it, it tells me that there's major problem jobs out there that are not getting fixed or solved or closed. So I would say from a sales perspective, it's those. From a commercial roofing perspective, it would be dollars in, in contracts or work orders per week. Um, and then how many how many proposals, how many dollars worth of proposals and estimates did you send out that week versus how many you're doing also that week. So you get two different tracks. One is very future, one is very now, and you start to see if they're relating well to know if you're closing enough based on your efforts of how much work you're doing every week for the future. Why so many people fail in this industry? Why so many great minds? Because it's hard. It's really There's hard. So, so many talented people, boys, girls, young, old. You see them, you see the greatness mm -hmm. and they just fail. Like I see it all the time. Someone starts, have a great potential. You see it, they run one or two years. As a matter of fact, with social media, you see the journey way more yeah. clear because in right. front of everybody you, you see someone's posting all his checks and everything mm -hmm. and does two million a year mm -hmm. and then a year later uh i would say that's a complicated answer but most of it i would say is because they don't hire the right people to do the jobs they should be doing and they're trying to do things that you have no business doing hmm. as an owner uh 
I was involved in the finances for like the first year and a half, maybe two years of my business. Uh, and I needed to get out of it as fast as possible because it's not what I should be doing. I would mess everything up if I was really the one managing all of that. Um, so I would say the perspective of the young entrepreneur trying to hold everything and run everything is probably what results in most of that. I had the opposite response. I looked at what I was doing by the day and the week and the month, and I picked this thing. I was like, I don't ever want to do this again. I need to find somebody to do this. Hey, you, hey, you're doing this thing from here on out. I'll, I'll run alongside you for a couple weeks or a couple months or whatever it takes, and I don't ever want to see that thing again because it's, that doesn't fit my skill set. I'm not good at it. I've been able to function at it at some level to get to here, but I needed to operate much better in order for us not to run into the place where we're going to end up you know, making enough mistakes that we have a big problem. And so I offloaded everything as soon as I could. Did you start catch all because there's no money in the roofing? No. <laughs> Why did you start catch all? Uh, uh, I literally just invented catch all because I wanted to solve that problem on my own jobs. Just started with ASL? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to. I hated the friction point of people being unsatisfied at the end of the roof because of something that I felt like was such a minor detail. Um, nails and trash in the grass and the bushes, you know, it's kind of a small detail in my mind. The, the reason I ask this tricky question because I have a follow up question. Yes. So many people are not concerned, but negative towards roofers inventing products apps to, yeah, yeah, for yeah. roofers and i see the trend people are commenting because i interview a lot of people yeah, like yeah. last one it was actually i thought it was an amazing app and i see this negative hate comments mm -hmm. like why everyone have to have some because i think we're entrepreneurs and well i think you gotta you gotta know there's a difference yeah there's some of us that are in this business because we're entrepreneurs and there's some of us that are in this business because they really like roofing <laughs> So there's a very big difference. Sure. Some people are passionate about, passionate about roofing because their dad did it and they grew up doing it and they want to be the world's actual best physical sure. roofer, right? No problems with those people. Sure. We need people like that. Yeah. But entrepreneurs, you're surprised that an entrepreneur has an idea of something else he wants to do? Exactly. That's what entrepreneurs do. Exactly. Most entrepreneurs are visionaries, so they build a thing and then they don't want to do that thing anymore. And they want to go build another thing. That's that's their, how they they're wired. They want to solve another problem. Exactly. I get very excited about creating a solution or inventing something or creating something from nothing. Mm -hmm. The catch-all, there was nothing like it. There's no product space. There's no search terms for me to attach that product to so that people can find me because nobody's ever made anything like that before. So inventing something like that that just doesn't exist is very exciting to me. The problem, experiencing it over and over and over again, my mind wanted to solve the problem. It didn't even matter whether there was money in it. I just literally wanted to conquer the problem. At some point, I got so frustrated that I just wanted to find a solution to be able to say to myself, I'm not going to have this problem anymore. And so that's all I did it for. I didn't have, there was no money motivation in creating the catch-all. I was just going to use it on my own jobs. Um, as soon as we put our test kits out in the field and we started using them on our own jobs, uh, people wanted to buy it immediately. And, and originally, I was like, no, I'm not going to sell. I'm just going to keep it proprietary. And to be clear, I mean, in the markets that I'm in, I would be slaughtering my competition if I was the only one that had that. Um, I'd be pitching it so hard, it would be the main point of all my sales processes and I would be crushing it. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm not that aggressive. I'm not like a shark. You know, I don't have to destroy other people's businesses to feel sure. successful. And so I thought it would be fun, a fun experience to raise the standard. And you know what's interesting? I have seen, because I started my research in trying to figure out how to solve this problem outside of my own ideas, I started trolling through Facebook groups back when they were a lot smaller, there wasn't as many of them. Um, and I started seeing with, started looking into other countries and how they protected their jobs, how they did roofing jobs. And then I started looking to other parts of the country and I saw that people do it differently. Some people take a tarp and they nail it up on the edge of the eave, they wrap it up over, and they stick it down the yard and just all the material slides out. And I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, man, that's so cool that like, Somebody has tried to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And in watching that journey, I look at everybody's job site photos just as a matter of curiosity, just to see what they do. And there's a ton of people that have bought catch-alls. There's a ton of people that don't want to buy catch-alls. But I see those people protecting their job sites better than they did before. Using more tarps, using more plywood, wrapping things up better, covering more things, realizing that there is a higher level of excellence they can shoot for. And that makes me just as happy as somebody buying a catch-all. 
So the guys that get on there and criticize, like, oh, that's going to tear up in five minutes, or oh, that's too expensive because they have no idea what they're really getting, you know? They're like, oh, it's too expensive. Uh, I could buy that for 150 bucks, and <laughs> zero chance you could ever do that. Yeah. Um, and so then they go and they buy one tarp and some two by fours, and they hang it on the front of the house and they spray paint their sign on it. And uh, they're like, see, I built my catch all. <laughs> but you know what? Their bushes are wrapped better than they were before. Yeah. Because they saw us the doing st- it. standard is Exactly. Higher. And I appreciate that. I've said it's satisfying for me to Hard. see people trying harder to protect their jobs. And whether they use the catch-all or they don't, I don't really care at this point. You know, I don't, I don't need, I don't do any of what I'm doing at this point in my life to make more money. Um, so I So what drives st- you? What satisfies you? If you don't do yeah. it for the money, what drives you? I would say two things. At a personal internal motivation, uh, it's the process of creating things. I really enjoy that. Um, in my heart I enjoy helping other people succeed in whatever it is they want to do so creating a place where people can work and giving them a job in a better workplace than they had before with better benefits with a better trajectory that more aligns with their personality and their vision and their goals and what they want to do is super satisfying for me and so that's why at Avco they had to take away the firing role for me because I I exist to create jobs and create opportunities for people. So you so don't it was fire so people. So hard for me to fire people. I was so bad at it. So who, who fires people? Who did you delegate it to? Uh, well, now it's more departmental, but um, I'd say the record goes to Ronnie Lawler, my COO. He has fired a lot of people, <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty funny story. Uh, there's one particular person who really deserved to be fired, very measurably. Did a lot of things wrong. Um, and we had waited too long like we typically do because everybody felt bad for her because she was struggling with some personal issues and um, we're like it has to happen today Ronnie you got to do it today before the end of the day he's like I'm going to do it as soon as she gets here and she walks in the door and her little daughter's with her because she couldn't <laughs> take her daughter to work and uh, you know he fired her with her daughter there and her daughter was in her office crying and putting the stuff in the box like <laughs> packing her stuff up and it was really sad and hard wow. uh, but it was a great lesson for us we have to do it better and we have to do it faster. It has to be more constructive for that person and it has to be better for the people that work around them. That's usually where the damage is, is the people that work around the person you didn't fire, they're all suffering. Well said, I completely so, agree. So yeah, they had to take that away from me because I was not very good at doing that. Can you name a couple marketing mistakes that the roofers make? <laughs> oh man. You're just trying to get people mad at me. Oh, gosh. No, no, let's, uh, let's call it out. See how it is. Yeah. Letting some guy in your DMs convince you to give you even $5,000 a month to get online leads for you. That's probably the number one mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thinking that there's an easy button. Is you're just going to be able to pay somebody a bunch of money and your business is somehow going to magically grow and you didn't do any of the work? And, Not and you're na- nailing it right now because so many roofers, they, they say they want to help. They, they want you to do it for them. They, yeah, don't, yeah. Want to, they no. don't want to do it. There is they no would rather way. hire, throw money on the problem than fix it. Up. Yeah, well, there is no way around marketing in my opinion. You've got to do it well with all your you heart learn and all it. your effort. You have to learn it and know it. You need to be doing it or someone very close to you that understands all of your values and your vision has to be doing it for you. Uh, It's one of the reasons there's a particular person I appreciate, uh, Joseph Hughes. He teaches people how to do their own thing. He doesn't try to do it for them. And he tells them, you have to do this or it's not going to work. And I appreciate that because so many marketers are like, just give me the money and it's magically going to get better. I promise. I guarantee I'm going to get you this many leads in this much time. And it never, never, ever, not once has it ever happened. But, but marketers, are, they suck at what they do, but they, they, the, the really good thing, they're only good at one thing, selling themselves, market themselves to roofers. I disagree, how? Dimitri, completely. Why? Because if a guy hits me up in my DMs, I've never no, met no. him. I've ne- hold on. I've never heard of him. I've never been sure. to his website. I've never seen anything about him. And he thinks he's going to convince me, sure. a marketer, to give him money. And I've never heard of his ass. But he's, this is no way he's the, good at the, it. The, the, the same with me. But but those marketers, they, the, their name and their marketing, their ad that you see to yeah. scroll, mm-hmm. it's usually good for them. Right. Oh, no, uh, I get that part. You know, you know what I'm, I'm just saying they're not good at it because if they were good at it, they would have driven me to their website I know, to I find know. the information. There's no and referrals. With them. There's no recommendations. Yes. But, but the only thing they're good at is like to create their ad. Not, you, I'm you, like, can you show me? Here, here's what I always do. I'm like, can you show me your best ad ever that actually makes someone money? Someone I can call right, and say, right. like, hey, this guy created this guy. 
an ad and that ad generated 500 leads last year. Can Maybe. you show me that? Yeah. I mean, I'm tired of seeing your ad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like you're gonna, you're gonna drive people to my website. Who's been to your website? Half of them don't even have a damn website or you go to it and it's garbage. So true. So you're gonna, you're gonna drive leads to my website you can't drive me to your website? So stop buying from guys from your GMs. Yes. And, and those guys are so annoying. They're like, <laughs> They're so are you ready to, I'm a roofing insights now. And people are like, Misha, I look you up. Do you want, do you need more roofing jobs? I'm like, dude, how lazy are you? Look up what roofing insights is. I know, is. I know. They DM me and they've never even looked at my profile. They don't even know what my company is. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I literally, I mean, at least 20 different people a week message me or comment on something or something about that. And every time I get one of those messages, and every once in a while I'll do, I literally just go like, because they'll be aggressive, they'll hit you like five times, yeah. then they figure out your phone number and they try to call you or they try to email you. I'm like, how the fuck does this guy get my email? And then like, so I'll just respond to him, I'll respond to him like, uh, do, you, do you literally not think that I've got a hundred of these messages in the last 30 days? Like a hundred actual people have sent me this same message, which is some version of fake relationship. Hey, I see you're in roofing, I'd like to connect. Um, blah, 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 blah. Do you do commercial when, I mean, you can look at my website. Obviously, I do commercial roofing. Okay, cool. Could you handle like 10 more jobs a week? No, I couldn't. I'm sorry. I'm too busy. You know, like, I just hate that crap. No, oh, I know. Me too. It's so it's frustrating. Me. I don't know. I don't get why they think it works. Has it ever worked? I mean, it must work, I guess, well, to somebody somewhere. Well, because what they do, they don't need a lot. I mean, think about it. You're talking yeah. about a kid who probably lives in mom's basement. Oh, he totally. Need, he needs $5,000 a month. That's two sales. Right. right. So he'll send 1,000 messages. He'll yeah, be yeah. good for that month. I guess so. That's I all they so. do. Underrated marketing platforms or uh, marketing ways to uh, ways to oh, advertise. The strategy, marketing yeah. strategies yeah. that I think are underrated. Yeah. Um, this one's pretty divisive. There's a lot of people that like it, but I would have to say uh, door knocking is pretty underrated. And do you think most, so? most people, well, the people that don't do it, sure. they look at it like it's this big negative thing because in their mind, they imagine the greasy storm chaser guy sure. who's pounding on all the doors and lying to all the customers. But even people who are retail, in my mind, it's absolute laziness that when you do a job, you don't knock the neighbor's doors and just say, hey, we did this person's roof, can I give you a presentation? I don't call that as door knocking, it's but introduction it is door to knocking. the neighbors. Yeah, it but is. But it is door knocking. But, but, it it, takes but, the... but it's not like wake up in the morning, go conquer this neighborhood. If you're already right. in the neighborhood, you own it to yourself. To well, but that's the misconception. To... Most door knockers are only doing that. They're only working around the jobs they've already got. They're only working their referrals and they knock around the referrals. They're not like going where they knock a thousand doors a day and pissing off all these people and going into all the places you're not supposed to knock. Most people don't do that. Okay. Now, so there are industries like maybe alarms and, you know, satellite and stuff like that where they do operate more like that. But in roofing, you don't have time to, you can't, you can't gain 20 new customers a week and still knock any doors. You can't just knock a million doors a week and, sure. you know, do that. I mean, door knockers in roofing, if they're into their pipeline and they've been in the job for a while, I mean, they might not, they might knock 30 to 60 doors a week. What else is underrated, do you think? Uh, uh, a real, truly engaging social. Social, Yeah. yeah. 100%. Being on your Facebook, showing who you are, showing your jobs, engaging with your customers, showing a genuine representation of who you are as the owner or the GM or whoever's going to be the face. Not just trying to sell on every video. Yeah, no, you Call don't need to do that. Yeah, yeah, totally. You're not trying to convert on everything, but have a, 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 a truly active social space that shows all sides and facets of the business that would, might be interesting to someone. But at the end of the day, through social, what you're trying to create is a relationship. And sometimes that's a relationship with your business, but most of the time it's a relationship with the person who's in the video. They're giving information about the business, but that person is gaining rapport and credibility and understanding of who that individual is. And that's not hard to do. It just takes time, but it's not difficult. Absolutely. Um, but most people don't do it because they think there's some big giant strategy they don't understand or they don't think it's worth it. They don't want to be vulnerable and be on camera. And uh, I mean, that's just foolishness because it's highly underrated. It'll bring you the most powerful leads you'll ever get would be the people who've seen you on Facebook for the last year or two and thought you were really cool and appreciated your viewpoints on life and want, you, want to use you. Where's your work-life balance in, at this time of your career? Yeah, for me, um, I have a dedicated amount of time per week that I put into each of the businesses and ventures that I'm running. Um, What's the split between Catch-All and AFCO? I would say at the moment, um, Catch-All might get a hair more than AFCO. It's usually pretty close, but depending on the season, one will get a little bit more than the other. Um, I have some other projects, things that we're inventing that take a little bit of my time, um, but the majority of my time goes into those two places. So what else gets your time? Uh, my kids get most of my time. Oh. My boys probably get the most 
uninterrupted FaceTime with me in my life than anybody else. Um, as far as how I do the balance, um, it starts with priorities. What's actually the most important to you? At the moment. Well, you can look at it at the moment and you look and when it relates to family, you need to look 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. What do you want your kids to remember 10 years from now? Um, what do you want to have contributed to their life? What level of relationship do you want to have with your spouse and your kids and your family uh, in 10 years? Because if you don't have that uh, as a boundary, like how far you can go into any one direction, if you don't have that boundary that says that's too much, then typical entrepreneurs will go too far and they end up losing things they can't get back. I had a really cool conversation with a guy named Nathan Thibodeau um, a little while back from uh, Contractor Coach Pro and he was talking about the difference between delayed gratification and sacrifice. And when you're building something, it's okay to delay gratification, to delay the pay that you get, to delay the money you're gonna get, the freedom that you're gonna get. But when you sacrifice things, those are things you don't get back. And so if you work too much and you're not with your family, that's a sacrifice. You'll never get that back. Those years or those days or those softball games or baseball games or whatever it is you miss, you'll never get to redo those. Mm -hmm. So I try to be careful about not sacrificing things, but I'm okay with delaying gratification on other things. So to me, I prioritize. Look in the moment, a year down the road, five years, 10 years down the road, and reframe all of those things and figure out how much time I want to spend in which place um, so that I can achieve all those goals. Because you can absolutely build a business really quickly if you're willing to work an immense amount. Uh, but are, is it going to be worth the sacrifice to your family? Um, most people would say no, but in the moment they don't actually take the time to prioritize, so they end up doing that anyway. And oftentimes it's the thing that, the, the thing that they wish they didn't do. And so they justify it by saying, okay, well now we're at this point, we'll have more than we ever had, I'll never have to go through a season like that again, my kids will be set up for life. You know what? Your kids probably don't care probably don't care about that. They probably just want their mom and their dad at home. Sure. And so I start with priorities and then balance that out that way. But for entrepreneurs, there's not much balance. To imply that everything is 50-50 or totally equal is the thing that scares entrepreneurs away from even trying to do that because they're whole hog, gung-ho into the thing that they're excited about and they don't balance anything. Usually their, their friends are only at work. They don't usually have a lot of friends outside of that project or that work or that business. And so there isn't really a balance, but I do think that you can prioritize and choose to be intentional about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. So, absolutely. I would say entrepreneurs' lives are not balanced. So, absolutely. It's not a great term. Thank you so much for your time, Keith. It was an absolute pleasure again. Yeah, no problem. Good luck with everything.